Story goes that an uh, obscure Jewish prophet from a tiny little town known as Gath Heifer was called by God to take a message of repentance and of his amazing love to what was likely uh, the most evil city in the world at the time, and certainly the biggest city in the world at the time, a place that was uniformly evil, in fact beyond evil, the city of Nineveh. And uh, in Nineveh, they painted the walls of the palace with the blood of their victims, and they used uh, people's skins as posters, uh, and they ran down people on the streets with their chariots. It was the darkest of dark places, a, total, a place that was totally unworthy of God. And the God of the Israelites called a man named Jonah to go beyond the borders of Israel to call the Ninevites to repent. And Jonah didn't want to go for a lot of reasons, but in part because he was a Jewish zealot and he didn't understand what the God of the Israelites was doing, being gracious and merciful to the Gentiles, especially one as wicked and evil as Ninevites. So Jonah, as you probably know, didn't exactly take to his assignment with, say, enthusiasm, to say the least. He ran in the opposite direction. He hopped the ship, got thrown overboard. He got swallowed by a whale, spent three days and three nights in his belly, spit out on dry land, and he walked into the middle of Nineveh and cried out, Repent, or God will destroy you. And what did they do? They did. And what did Jonah do? He pouted because he believed that God was just the God of his nation and not all nations, a God who is unique to one people. However, this member of God's chosen people learned an important lesson. Because we are all united in sin, we are united in God's passion to show us grace. Several years after Jesus died, a man by the name of Ananias, living in the city of Damascus, had a vision. And this vision, the Lord God, I am, appeared to him and said, Ananias, rise and go to the street called Straight and go to the house of Judas and look for a man who is praying. Lay your hand on him so he might regain his sight. Here's what happened. This man was riding on his horse from Jerusalem to, to, to Damascus. And he had asked the high priest of the temple for an assignment. He wanted to go to the synagogues. He wanted to find people who were professing that Jesus, is, Jesus of Nazareth is Lord. And he wanted to find them and drag them out of their homes and, and, and off to prison. And as he got close to Damascus, he suddenly saw this great light shine down from heaven. And it knocked him off his horse onto the hard, dusty earth. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul the persecutor, Saul the murderer, Saul the greatest of all sinners, cried out and he said, Who are you? And the voice in the light said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He told Saul, Go into the city and wait for instructions. And when it, when it was all over, Saul stood up and he was blind. And he was riding with two men, two men who had seen the light, but they had not heard the voice. And they were dumbfounded and they led him to the city where he didn't eat or drink, or see anything for three days. When Ananias heard that it was Saul on whom the Lord wanted him to lay hands, he protested vigorously. He said, Lord, I've heard about this man. I've heard about this man. He's not a good man. He's not the kind of guy you want on your team, Lord. He can have me hauled off to prison and killed. If I lay hands on him, God, he might lay hands on me. And God responded, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Ananias went. He went to the street called Straight, and he found Saul, and he, he laid his hands on Saul, and Saul's sight was immediately restored, and Saul believed. They wasted no time in baptizing him, and Saul, who literally 72 hours later or, or, or earlier was persecuting and dragging Christians off to be killed, wasted no time in proclaiming in, in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. And everyone who heard him was absolutely amazed that this man, this man who came to Damascus to cause havoc for the church, was now a disciple of Jesus Christ. Saul moved from being a tormentor for the high priest to a target of the high priest. He had been trained by the finest teachers. He was upwardly mobile. He was groomed for a position of power and privilege in the temple. He knew the Hebrew scriptures, and he was very well trained in the law. He was privileged in birth. He was a Roman citizen. He was well schooled in Greek philosophy and Greek poetry. And Saul was also a zealot. 
absolutely committed to his faith and willing to hand over anyone to be killed who was dishonored by, who dishonored God by claiming this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was his only begotten son. And now, and now, Saul's former Jewish friends plotted to kill him. And we know what happened next uh, to Saul only because he wrote about it later in the church at Galatia. He said, when he would set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. So three years later, Paul went to Jerusalem and, uh, uh, and he attempted to join the disciples. And they welcomed him in with open arms. Right? No. This is Saul. He, they thought he was playing some kind of trick on them. And eventually they did, they did welcome him only because a man named Barnabas intervened. But soon Saul was forced to leave Jerusalem because his life was in danger. See, Saul, Saul had a problem. He had a problem. He really did. Um, he could not stop teaching. He could not stop preaching about Jesus. He was so dedicated to telling others about this God-man Jesus who knocked him off his horse. Saul had such a love for his fellow Jews who rejected Jesus that he claimed if he could trade places with any one of them, he would do it. To the church at Rome, he wrote these words, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off for Christ for the sake of my kinsmen. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, and the worship, and the promises. You know, um, we have deluded ourselves into, into thinking that the gospel is optional, that grace is a given, that heaven is a vacuous hope, and hell is an empty threat. Saul and the people who knew Jesus the best, they didn't think so. <laughs> They didn't think so, and they risked life and limb and health and welfare to demonstrate otherwise. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to ask, what does our life demonstrate? How does our life show the love of Jesus Christ? Well, Saul literally, literally to stay alive, literally to stay alive, returned to his homeland of Tarsus in Asia Minor. And he spent 10 years there studying and serving and learning about Jesus before the Holy Spirit spoke in a worship service at Saul's church. And here's what the Spirit said. The Spirit said, set me apart uh, for Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And the church fasted, and they prayed, and they laid hands on Saul and Barnabas, and they sent them off. The first man we know of who God brought to faith in Jesus through Saul was a Gentile man. He was a Roman officer. He was in the company of a false prophet, a magician, and this, and this man had power over him. And the Word teaches that Saul, who... Uh, who was never one to mince words. He looked intently at this man, the uh, magician, and he said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the paths of the Lord? And the magic man immediately fell blind, and he fell powerless, and the Roman believed. It was at about this time that Saul, God's chosen instrument to deliver the gospel to the Gentiles began going by another name, his Gentile name, his Roman name, Paul. Paul's next stop what, in what came to be known as his first missionary journey was at a synagogue in the region, in the region of Pisidia in Asia Minor. And he was sitting, simply sitting there in worship on the Sabbath. And after they read from the Scripture and the Law and the Prophets, Paul stood up. And he gave an impromptu sermon. His name wasn't even in the bulletin that day. <laughs> Try that here sometime. See what happens. <laughs> so Paul interpreted the entire Jewish history in the light of Jesus Christ, going back as far as the slavery in Egypt. He talked about wandering in the wilderness. And he talked about Samuel and David and the other Saul and John the Baptist. And then Paul said this about Jesus of Nazareth. He said, brothers... Sons of the family of Abraham, of those among you who fear God, we bring you the good news that God has promised to his fathers, that he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. 
As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And so the people, Jew and Gentile alike, begged Paul. They begged Paul to tell them more about Jesus. Has anyone ever begged us, tell me more about Jesus? Has anyone ever, have ever grabbed us by our, uh, by our shirt collar and said, tell me more about, about this Jesus? It is a wonderful gift, my friends. It is a wonderful gift to be given the words of light and life to share with someone dwelling in darkness and death. On the next Sabbath, the entire town, the entire region turned out to hear what Paul had to say. And the gospel spread throughout the countryside and the entire region shook with excitement. But the Jewish leaders, they didn't like this, this gospel that was being preached. And so, the, so they worked to, they, so they worked against Paul. They worked against Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas moved on to the next city, the city of Lystra. And at Lystra, they healed a man who, who had been crippled from birth, and they were mistaken for gods. And the priests of the temple there, a temple there dedicated to the Greek god Zeus, uh, even tried to sacrifice an oxen to them. And Paul told the people, wait a minute, we're not gods. We're not gods, but there is a God and he's revealed himself to you in a multitude of ways with rain and good harvest and filling your stomachs with food and your hearts with joy. Well, this isn't what the people want to hear. We are dedicated to our God. And Paul went immediately from God to goat. And so they said, well, if you're not God, we're going to stone you. So they carried him outside the city and they stoned him just like they did Stephen. And they thought he was dead, so they left him. But the next day, Paul got up and walked with Barnabas to another city. 